Now we come right out of the woods. Transpiration is the passive process by which water moves from the wetness of the soil up a plant and into the air via the leaves. We've known about it for years and you probably haven't thought about it since school. The assumption is that transpiration works by a wick effect, where the negative pressure of the water in the leaves draws up water from the roots but until now it has been impossible to replicate this process in the lab. Abraham Struck and Tobias Wheeler from Cornell University in New York have constructed a fake plastic tree which emulates the natural process. I spoke to Abraham Struck and started by asking why synthetic transpiration has been such a tall order. Now we come right out of the woods, transpiration is the passive process by which water moves from the wetness of the soil up a plant and into the air via the leaves. We've known about it for years and you probably haven't thought about it since school. The assumption is that transpiration works by a wick effect, where the negative pressure of the water in the leaves draws up water from the roots but until now it has been impossible to replicate this process in the lab. Abraham Struck and Tobias Wheeler from Cornell University in New York have constructed a fake plastic tree which emulates the natural process. I spoke to Abraham Struck and started by asking why synthetic transpiration has been such a tall order. A majority of U.S. high school students say they get bored in class every day, and more than one out of five has considered dropping out, according to a survey released Wednesday. The survey of 81,000 students in 26 states found two-thirds of high school students complain of boredom, usually because the subject matter was irrelevant or their teachers didn't seem to care about them. A majority of U.S. high school students say they get bored in class every day, and more than one out of five has considered dropping out, according to a survey released Wednesday. The survey of 81,000 students in 26 states found two-thirds of high school students complain of boredom, usually because the subject matter was irrelevant or their teachers didn't seem to care about them. Well in 2004 we integrated ticketing in southeast Queensland, so we introduced a paper ticket that allowed you to travel access all the three modes in southeast Queensland, so bus, train and ferry. And the second stage of integrated ticketing is the introduction of a smart card, and the smart card will enable people to store value, so to put value on the card, and then to use the card for traveling around the system. Well in 2004 we integrated ticketing in southeast Queensland, so we introduced a paper ticket that allowed you to travel access all the three modes in southeast Queensland, so bus, train and ferry. And the second stage of integrated ticketing is the introduction of a smart card, and the smart card will enable people to store value, so to put value on the card, and then to use the card for traveling around the system.
Well, Alex, the National Association of Realtors is at least putting the champagne on ice. The industry group says the slight rise in sales for previously owned homes shows the housing market is finally stabilizing, which is the first sign of a recovery. Now, that of course is an interpretation of the numbers, Alex, and one that's coming from an organization known for being somewhat of a cheerleader for the housing market, since its members are made up of realtors who've been losing a lot of money in the slump. Now, for a more sober view, I talked to Wellesley housing economist Carl Case. And he says the slight uptick in sales hardly offsets the fact that numbers are down 20% from the year before. Well, Alex, the National Association of Realtors is at least putting the champagne on ice. The industry group says the slight rise in sales for previously owned homes shows the housing market is finally stabilizing, which is the first sign of a recovery. Now, that of course is an interpretation of the numbers, Alex, and one that's coming from an organization known for being somewhat of a cheerleader for the housing market, since its members are made up of realtors who've been losing a lot of money in the slump. Now, for a more sober view, I talked to Wellesley housing economist Carl Case, and he says the slight uptick in sales hardly offsets the fact that numbers are down 20% from the year before. In animals, a movement is coordinated by a cluster of neurons in the spinal cord called the central patterns generator CPG. This produces signals that drive muscles to contract rhythmically in a way that produces running or walking, depending on the pattern of pulses. A simple signal from the brain instructs the CPG to switch between modes such as going from a standstill to walking. In animals, a movement is coordinated by a cluster of neurons in the spinal cord called the central patterns generator CPG. This produces signals that drive muscles to contract rhythmically in a way that produces running or walking, depending on the pattern of pulses. A simple signal from the brain instructs the CPG to switch between modes such as going from a standstill to walking. I'm a big fan of gap years. I took one myself so I'm probably biased. I think that if you've got something you want to do in the year before you come to university, that you should do it. And a lot of students who want to study a biology degree actually want to go off and travel and perhaps work on a conservation project. And of course, that's all very good. It will contribute towards your degree and your preparation for that. And then when you come to us, you'll be ready for your studies. So if there's something you really want to do, then my advice is to go for it. I'm a big fan of gap years. I took one myself, so I'm probably biased. I think that if you've got something you want to do in the year before you come to university, that you should do it. And a lot of students who want to study a biology degree actually want to go off and travel and perhaps work on a conservation project. And of course, that's all very good. 
It will contribute towards your degree and your preparation for that. And then when you come to us, you'll be ready for your studies. So if there's something you really want to do, then my advice is to go for it. An economist sees the world basically through a typical microeconomic toolkit that involves things like thinking at the margin rationality, opportunity cost, trade-offs. Economists, like any other discipline or dogma, has its own jargon and its own rules and its own way of seeing the world. So basically economics, or economists in general, tend to apply microeconomic concepts like that to explain the way humans behave and to make predictions about the future. An economist sees the world basically through a typical microeconomic toolkit that involves things like thinking at the margin rationality, opportunity cost, trade-offs. Economists, like any other discipline or dogma, has its own jargon and its own rules and its own way of seeing the world. So basically economics, or economists in general, tend to apply microeconomic concepts like that to explain the way humans behave and to make predictions about the future. So it's a fantastic place to be a puffin. There are no ground predators. There is protection. On the other hand, if you're going to increase in numbers, and we increased from five pairs then to 2,000 pairs in 1972. When I started up to about 80,000 pairs in 2003, you've got to have a lot of food. I mean you've got to have a hell of a lot of fish however small a bird that you are. And there seems to be profound changes in the North Sea where man removed all the large fish, the large cod the haddock and those sorts of things, for human consumption. And the numbers of small fish increased and this allowed the seabirds to increase. You've got a lot of big fish that are of no use to seabirds, they're just too big. I mean puffins will only eat fish up to about 20 centimeters long. Anything bigger than that is safe from a puffin. So it's a fantastic place to be a puffin. There are no ground predators. There is protection. On the other hand, if you're going to increase in numbers, and we increased from five pairs then to 2,000 pairs in 1972. When I started up to about 80,000 pairs in 2003, you've got to have a lot of food. I mean you've got to have a hell of a lot of fish however small a bird that you are. And there seems to be profound changes in the North Sea where man removed all the large fish, the large cod the haddock and those sorts of things, for human consumption. And the numbers of small fish increased and this allowed the seabirds to increase. You've got a lot of big fish that are of no use to seabirds, they're just too big. I mean puffins will only eat fish up to about 20 centimeters long. Anything bigger than that is safe from a puffin. So every year influenza does strike. It causes seasonal flu outbreaks and that's caused by new influenza strains. It affects about 5 to 20 percent of U.S. residents, and 200,000 people become sick each year, and 36,000 people die from flu. And sometimes flu viruses can actually mutate to form novel viruses. 
We worry about novel influences subtypes, because they can cause pandemics, and a pandemic is a global outbreak of a disease. The most severe influence of pandemic in the last century occurred in 1980. And it was caused by a flu virus called H1N1. It began in the United States around September 14, and within five weeks, and it spread throughout the entire United States. It's estimated that 20 to 100 million people died worldwide from that year and it included 500,000 Americans. So every year influenza does strike. It causes seasonal flu outbreaks and that's caused by new influenza strains. It affects about 5 to 20 percent of U.S. residents, and 200,000 people become sick each year and 36,000 people die from flu. And sometimes flu viruses can actually mutate to form novel viruses. We worry about novel influences subtypes, because they can cause pandemics, and a pandemic is a global outbreak of a disease. The most severe influence of pandemic in the last century occurred in 1980. And it was caused by a flu virus called H1N1. It began in the United States around September 14, and within five weeks, and it spread throughout the entire United States. It's estimated that 20 to 100 million people died worldwide from that year and it included 500,000 Americans. For many years the favorite horror story about abrupt climate change was that a shift in ocean currents could radically cool Europe's climate. These currents, called the overturning circulation, bring warm water and warm temperatures north from the equator to Europe. Susan Lucier, an oceanographer at Duke University, says scientists have long worried that this ocean circulation could be disrupted. For many years the favorite horror story about abrupt climate change was that a shift in ocean currents could radically cool Europe's climate. These currents, called the overturning circulation, bring warm water and warm temperatures north from the equator to Europe. Susan Lucier, an oceanographer at Duke University, says scientists have long worried that this ocean circulation could be disrupted. Rutch and her colleague Mark Newman studied who swapped messages with whom on a popular online dating platform in the month of January 2014. They categorized users by desirability using PageRank, one of the algorithms behind search technology. Essentially, if you receive a dozen messages from desirable users, you must be more desirable than someone who receives the same number of messages from average users. Then they asked, how far out of their league do online daters tend to go when pursuing a partner? I think people are optimistic realists. In other words, they found that both men and women tended to pursue mates just 25% more desirable than themselves. So they're being optimistic, but they're also taking into account their own relative position within this overall desirability hierarchy. All the graphs and charts are in the journal Science Advances, and the study did have a few more lessons for people on the market. I think one of the take-home messages from this study is that women could probably afford to be more aspirational in their mate pursuit.
Grutch and her colleague Mark Newman studied who swapped messages with whom on a popular online dating platform in the month of January 2014. They categorized users by desirability using PageRank, one of the algorithms behind search technology. Essentially, if you receive a dozen messages from desirable users, you must be more desirable than someone who receives the same number of messages from average users. Then they asked, how far out of their league do online daters tend to go when pursuing a partner? I think people are optimistic realists. In other words, they found that both men and women tended to pursue mates just 25% more desirable than themselves. So they're being optimistic, but they're also taking into account their own relative position within this overall desirability hierarchy. All the graphs and charts are in the journal Science Advances, and the study did have a few more lessons for people on the market. I think one of the take-home messages from this study is that women could probably afford to be more aspirational in their mate pursuit. I think it's often underestimated the connection between doing research, live research, and teaching undergraduates and the undergraduate programs. Because, of course if you're working at CERN on a frontier experiment you come back to give a lecture, you're buzzing with activity of what's going on your new results. It just makes the whole lecture much more interesting for students. It's always really exciting to look ahead at new science and what might happen in the future. I must say, lots depends on what we find in the next few years at the start of the Large Hadron Collider. We are expecting to find very many new phenomena. So the thing we'll want to be building in 10 years time will depend on what we find. I think it's often underestimated the connection between doing research, live research, and teaching undergraduates and the undergraduate programs. Because, of course if you're working at CERN on a frontier experiment you come back to give a lecture, you're buzzing with activity of what's going on your new results. It just makes the whole lecture much more interesting for students. It's always really exciting to look ahead at new science and what might happen in the future. I must say, lots depends on what we find in the next few years at the start of the Large Hadron Collider. We are expecting to find very many new phenomena. So the thing we'll want to be building in 10 years time will depend on what we find. Rebuilding carbon-rich agricultural soils is the only real productive, permanent solution to taking excess carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. She's frustrated that scientists and politicians don't see the same opportunities she sees. This year Australia will emit just over 600 million tons of carbon. We can sequester 685 million tons of carbon by increasing soil carbon by half a percent on only 2% of the farms. If we increased it on all of the farms, we could sequester the whole world's emissions of carbon. Rebuilding carbon-rich agricultural soils is the only real productive, permanent solution to taking excess carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. She's frustrated that scientists and politicians don't see the same opportunities she sees. This year Australia will emit just over 600 million tons of carbon. 
we can sequester 685 million tons of carbon by increasing soil carbon by half a percent on only 2% of the farms. If we increased it on all of the farms, we could sequester the whole world's emissions of carbon. The effect of the first difference is, on the one hand, to refine and enlarge the public views, by passing them through the medium of a chosen body of citizens, whose wisdom may best discern the true interest of their country, and whose patriotism and love of justice will be least likely to sacrifice it to temporary or partial considerations. The effect of the first difference is, on the one hand, to refine and enlarge the public views, by passing them through the medium of a chosen body of citizens, whose wisdom may best discern the true interest of their country, and whose patriotism and love of justice will be least likely to sacrifice it to temporary or partial considerations. Okay, see, the thing is that I've had a look at the peer reviews about the funding application, which you suggested that I do. But what I found is that several reviewers are saying that there isn't actually sufficient focus on my topic. Right. I think that is actually the case, but I remember that the proposal is based around things that have already been done. And the fact that it's just one of a number of factors. And these affect health and safety. I think areas around of stress, they cover up much more ground. So I think, if you're sort of upfront about it, and you say, look, I need a wider spectrum here. We could perhaps suggest something else to try and measure bullying in the workplace. Okay, see, the thing is that I've had a look at the peer reviews about the funding application, which you suggested that I do. But what I found is that several reviewers are saying that there isn't actually sufficient focus on my topic. Right. I think that is actually the case, but I remember that the proposal is based around things that have already been done. And the fact that it's just one of a number of factors. And these affect health and safety. I think areas around of stress, they cover up much more ground. So I think, if you're sort of upfront about it, and you say, look, I need a wider spectrum here, we could perhaps suggest something else to try and measure bullying in the workplace. Help us understand what entrepreneurship means to you. Is it just about starting companies? Not at all, Dina. I think, for me, entrepreneurship is about transforming things by initiating by taking new ideas, by seeing them from concept into practice, so that the impact of the idea is larger than it would be. Let's say, if you just wrote a publication about it. So, I think it's finding creative ways to solve problems, to do new things, and I think that's what it's about. So, I think entrepreneurship can happen inside universities, I think we try to think of ourselves as an entrepreneurial university. We take risks, we try new things, and I think that's an important asset for anyone who wants to lead an organization or lead change.
help us understand what entrepreneurship means to you. Is it just about starting companies? Not at all, Dina. I think, for me, entrepreneurship is about transforming things by initiating by taking new ideas, by seeing them from concept into practice, so that the impact of the idea is larger than it would be. Let's say, if you just wrote a publication about it. So, I think it's finding creative ways to solve problems, to do new things, and I think that's what it's about. So, I think entrepreneurship can happen inside universities, I think we try to think of ourselves as an entrepreneurial university. We take risks, we try new things, and I think that's an important asset for anyone who wants to lead an organization or lead change.